This is chapter three of Cancer Ward by Alexander I. Solzhenitsyn. Chapter three, Teddy Bear, narrated to you by Carter Banks. Although Zoya was quick and alert, moving very swiftly about the wards, from tables to bed and back again, she realized she would not be able to deal with all the prescriptions before lights out. So she hurried to finish and put the lights out in the men's ward. In the large women's ward, it was huge, with more than 30 beds in it. The women never settled down, at proper time anyway, whether the light was turned off or not. Many of them had been there a long time and were thoroughly tired of the hospital. They slept badly, it was stuffy, and there were always arguments about whether the door to the terrace would be kept open or shut. And there were even a few dedicated enthusiasts who talked across the room from one end to the other, discussing everything from prices, goods, furniture, children, men, neighbors, right down to the most shameless subjects imaginable until midnight or one in the morning. On top of it all, Nelia, the orderly, was washing the floor there that evening. She was a loud-mouthed, round-bottomed girl with thick eyebrows and lips. She had started the job ages ago, but would never get through because she butted in on every single conversation. Meanwhile, Sibgatov was waiting for his wash. His bed was in the hall next to the entrance to the men's ward. Because of these nightly washes, and also because he felt ashamed of the foul smell from his back, Sibgatov chose to stay out in the hall, even though he had been in the hospital longer than all the other residents. In fact, he was less like a patient than a member of the permanent staff. Dashing around in women's ward, Zoya gave Nelia a dressing down, and then another, but Nelia just snapped back and carried on slowly. She was no younger than Zoya, and thought it beneath her dignity to be under the other girl. Zoya had come to work today in a festive mood, but this defiance on the part of the orderly irritated her. As a rule, Zoya felt everyone had a right to his share of freedom, and that when one came to work, one was under no obligation to work oneself to death. But there was a reasonable limit somewhere, especially when it was sick people you were dealing with. Finally, when Zoya had taken everything round and finished, and Nelia was through with wiping the floor, they turned off the light in the women's ward and the top light in the hall. It was already after 11 when Nelia had prepared the warm solution on the second floor and brought it from there to Sibgatov in his usual bowl. Ooh, ah, 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 I'm dead on my feet, she yawned loudly. I feel like 40 winks. Listen, patient, I know you'll be sitting here a good hour. I'm not waiting for you to finish. What about taking the bowl down and emptying it yourself? The solid old building with its spacious halls had no upstairs drain. What Sharov Sibgatov had once been like was impossible to guess. There was nothing to go by. His suffering had been so prolonged that there was practically nothing left of his former self. Yet, after three years of continuous oppressive illness, this young Tartar was the gentlest and most courteous patient in the whole clinic. Often he would smile very weakly, as if to ask pardon for the trouble he had been causing for so long. After the four and six month periods he had spent lying there, he knew all the doctors, nurses, and orderlies as if they had been his own family. And they knew him, but Nelia was brand new. She had only been there a few weeks. It will be too heavy for me, Sibgatov objected quietly. 
If there was something smaller to put it in, I should do it myself, bit by bit. But Zoya's table was nearby. She heard what was happening and jumped up. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. He's not allowed to strain his back. And you'd make him carry the bowl, would you? She said all of this as though she were shouting, but in a half whisper, which only the three of them could hear. But now you replied quite calmly, her voice resounding over the whole floor. Why should I be ashamed? I'm worn out myself. You're on duty. You get paid for it said Zoya, indignantly, even more quietly. Ha! Huh, paid! You call that money? I can get more at the textile factory. Shh, shh! Can't you be quieter? Ooh! Nelia, her mass of hair all over the place, half groaned, half sighed to the whole hall. My lovely, lovely pillow. I am so sleepy. I spent last night living it up with the truck drivers. All right, patient. Put the bowl under your bed. I'll take it away in the morning. Without covering her mouth, she gave a deep, long, drawn-out yawn. When she had finished, she said to Zoya, I shall be in session in there on the sofa. And without waiting for permission, walked off to the corner door, which led into a room with upholstered furniture used for doctor's meetings and short daily conferences. She had left quite a lot of work unfinished. The spittoons had not been cleaned, and the landing floor could have done with a wash. But Zoya restrained herself, watching her large back disappear. Zoya had not been working there long, but already she was beginning to understand the annoying principle that the one who doesn't pull her weight is not asked to pull, while the one who does pulls for two. Elizaveta Anatolievna would be in in the morning. She'd do the cleaning and washing for Nelia and for herself. Sibgatov, now alone, uncovered his sacrum and lowered himself uncomfortably onto the bowl on the floor beside his bed. He sat there very quietly. Any careless movements jarred his pelvis. The searing sensation caused by anything touching the injured spot, even the constant contact of his underwear, was agonizing. And, of course, he tried to avoid lying on his back. Exactly what it was he had on his back, he had never actually seen, only groped at occasionally with his fingers. Two years ago, he had been brought in to the clinic on a stretcher, unable to stand or move his legs. Several doctors had examined him then, but it was always Ludmila Afanasyevna who had treated him and in four months the pain had gone completely. He could walk and bend freely and had nothing to complain of. When they discharged him, Ludmila Afasanyevna had warned him as he kissed her hand, Be careful, Sharaf. Don't leap about or knock yourself. But he hadn't been able to find the right sort of work and had to become a delivery man again. And as a delivery man... Could he avoid jumping down from back of the van onto the ground or stand by without helping the loader of the loader or driver? Everything had been all right until one day a drum had rolled off the van and struck Sharoff right on his bad spot. The wound had festered and refused to heal, and from that time on and from that time on Sigbatov Sibgatov had become chained to the cancer clinic. It was with lingering feeling of annoyance that Zoya sat down at her table to check once more that everyone had been given his treatment and to finish the already blurred lines of her notes with pen strokes that blurred on the poor quality paper even as she wrote. It would be useless to report her and against Zoya's nature she would have to deal with her herself yet that was just what she could not do with Nelia. There was nothing wrong with having a nap. When she had a good orderly, Zoya would go to sleep for half the night herself, but now she'd have to sit up. She was sitting, looking at her notes, when she heard a man come up and stand beside her. 
She raised her head. It was Kostoglatov, with his gangling frame, his unkempt, coal-black hair, and his large hands, which hardly fitted into the little side pockets of his hospital jacket. "'You should have been asleep ages ago,' Zoya chided him. "'What are you doing, walking around?' "'Good morning, Zoyenka,' said Kostoglatov as gently as he could, almost singing the words. "'Good night,' she gave him a fleeting smile. "'It was good evening when I was running after you with the thermometer. "'That was when you were on duty. "'You mustn't blame me, but now I'm your guest. "'Is that so?' "'She didn't consciously flutter her lashes or open her eyes wide. "'It just happened. "'What gave you the idea I'm receiving guests?' "'Well, every night, duty, you've always had your nose to the grindstone, "'but today I can't see any textbooks. "'Have you passed your last exam?' You're observant. Yes, I have. What mark did you get? Not that it matters. I got four out of five. Why does it matter? I thought you might only have got three and not want to talk about it. So now you're on holiday. She winked with light gaiety. And as she winked, it suddenly struck her. What was she worrying about? Two weeks holiday. What bliss. She didn't have to do anything except go to the clinic. Such a lot of free time. When she was on duty, she could read something light or chat to people. So I was right to come and visit you. All right, sit down. But, Zoya, as far as I remember in my day, the holiday used to start earlier, on January 25th. In the fall, we were picking cotton. Do it every year. How much longer have you got at college? 18 months. Then where will you be posted to? She shrugged, her gently rounded shoulders. Ours is a big country. Her eyes were enormous, even when her face was calm. It was as if there was no room for them under her eyelids, as if they were begging to be let out. But they won't leave you here. N no of course not. How can you leave your family? What family? I've only got a grandmother. I'll take grandmother with me. What about your father and mother? Zoya sighed. My mother died. Kostoglatov looked at her and did not ask about her father. But you come from round here, don't you? No, from Smolensk. Really? When did you leave there? During the evacuation. When else? You were. About nine? Yeah, I was at school for two years there. Then Grandma and I got stuck here. Zoya reached toward the long, toward the large orange shopping bag on the floor by the wall, pulled out a mirror, took off her nurse's cap, lightly fluffed up her hair, which was crammed under it, and started to comb out a slightly curling fine golden strand. A golden reflection from it appeared on Kostoglatov's hard face. He relaxed a little and followed her movements with pleasure. Uh, so there's an asterisk at the bottom of the page. I'm not sure yet how to do these. I think I'll just put them in here and then I'll figure out if I should inject them later. But the, uh, the asterisk says, in Central Asia, there is a shortage of cotton pickers. Every fall, students are sent to help. So the school year starts later than in Leningrad, where Kostoglatov had studied thus making the holidays later, too. All right, well, that makes sense, then. So where's your grandmother? Asked Zoya. So where's your grandmother? Asked Zoya jokingly, as she finished with the mirror. My grandmother, Kostoglatov, was being completely serious. And my ma, the word was at odds with his bitter expression, died in the siege. The siege of Leningrad? Oh, ho. Oh. And my sister was killed by a shell. She was a nurse, just like you, only more of a child. Yes, sighed Zoya, ignoring the allusion to child. So many people died in the siege. Damn Hitler. Kostoglatov gave a weary grin. We've had more than enough proof of Hitler being damned. But I wouldn't blame the Leningrad blockade on him alone. What do you mean? Why not? Well... 
Listen, Hitler came to annihilate us. Were the besieged supposed to wait for him to open the gate and say, Come out, one enemy. Come out one by one. Don't crowd together. He was making war. He was an enemy. But there was someone else responsible for the blockade, too. Who? whispered Zoya, quite astounded. She had never heard or imagined anything like it. Kostoglatov knit his black brows. Well, let's say those who would have been prepared to fight even if England, France, and America had joined Hitler as allies. Those who drew their salaries for decades without seeing how Leningrad was geographically isolated and that this would affect its defense. Those who failed to foresee how heavy the bombardments would be and never thought of stocking up on provisions below ground. They strangled my mother, too. They and Hitler. It was all so simple, but somehow terribly new. Sibgatov was sitting quietly on his bull in the corner behind them. In that case, surely they ought to be put on trial, ventured Zoya in a whisper. I don't know, Kostoglatov grimaced, his lips an even thinner line than before. I don't know. Zoya did not put her cap back on. The top button of her uniform was undone, and the gold-gray collar of her dress peeped out. Zoyanka, I did come to see you partly on business. Did you know? Her eyelashes jerked up. Well, then. It'll have to wait till day duty. Now it's time for sleep. You did say you were just visiting, didn't you? Yes, I... I'm visiting, too. But before you get spoiled by it all, before you become a fully qualified doctor, just give me a helping hand as a human being. Don't the doctors do that? Well, theirs is a different sort of hand, and they don't stretch it out. Zoya, all my life I've hated being a guinea pig. They're giving me treatment here. But nobody explains anything. I can't stand it. I saw you with a book the other day. Pathological Anatomy. Is that right? Yes. And it's about tumors, yes? Yes. Do me a favor and bring it to me. I must have a look at it and try to work things out for myself. Zoya pursed her lips and shook her head. It's strictly against the rules for patients to read medical books. Even when we students study a particular disease, we always imagine that. It may be against the rules for others, but not for me. Kostoglatov slapped his big paw down on the table. They've tried to scare me out of my wits so many times I've stopped being scared. In the regional hospital, I was diagnosed by a Korean surgeon. It was New Year's Eve. He didn't want to tell me what was wrong. Speak the truth, man, I said. We're not allowed to do that here. Speak, I said. I must put my family affairs in order. So he blurted out, You'll live another three weeks. I won't guarantee you any longer than that. He didn't have the right to. He was a good man. A human being. I shook him by the hand. You see, I had to know. I'd tormented myself for six months before that. The last month I hadn't been able to lie, sit down, or stand without it hurting. And I was only sleeping a few minutes a day. So I must have done plenty of thinking. This autumn... I learned from experience that a man can, can cross the threshold of death even when his body is still not dead. Even when his body is still not dead, your blood still circulates and your stomach digests while you yourself have gone through the whole psychological preparation for death and lived through death itself. Everything around you, you see as is from the grave. And although you've never counted yourself a Christian, indeed, the very opposite sometimes, all of a sudden you find you've forgiven all those who trespassed against you and bear no ill will toward those who persecuted you. You're simply indifferent to everyone and everything. There's nothing you'd put yourself out to change. You regret nothing. I'd even say it was a state of equilibrium, as natural 
as that of the trees and the stones. Now, I've been taken out of it, but I'm not sure whether I should be pleased or not. It means the return of all my passions, the bad as well as the good. Ha! What cheek! You've got plenty to be pleased about. When you were admitted here, how many days ago was it? Twelve. There you were, writhing about on the couch, right here in the hall. You were an appalling sight. You had a face like a corpse, wouldn't eat a thing, and a temperature over a hundred, morning and evening, you know. And now, you go visiting, it's a miracle, for a man to come to life again like that in twelve days, it hardly ever happens here. Indeed, his face had been covered in deep gray creases as if hacked out with a chisel, evidence of his constant tension. But now there were fewer of them, and they had be become lighter. I was lucky. It turned out I had a high tolerance to x-rays. Yes, it's very rare. It's a stroke of luck, said Zoya warmly. Kostoglatov grinned. I haven't had all that much luck in my life, so the x-ray business is only fair, isn't it? I've started to dream again. Vague, pleasant dreams. I think it's a sign I'm getting better. Very possibly. Well then, all the more reason why I have to understand and investigate. I want to understand exactly how I'm being treated, what the long-term prospects are, what the complications are. I feel so much better, perhaps the treatment should be stopped altogether. Anyway, I want to understand it. Ludmila Afanasyevna and Van Kornilievna don't tell me anything. They just give me the treatment as if I were a monkey. Please, bring me the book, Zoya, please. I won't give you away. I won't give you away. Nobody will see me with it, I promise you. He was so insistent that he became quite animated. Zoya hesitated. She took hold of the handle of one of the drawers in her table. Is it there? Kostoglatov guessed at once. Zoyanka, give it to me. His hand was outstretched, ready for it. When are you next on duty? Sunday afternoon. I'll give it back to you then, all right? Is it a bargain? How pleasant and easygoing she was, with that golden hair, those great wide eyes. If only he could have seen himself, his hair matted from lying on the pillow, sticking up in pointed tufts all over his head, one corner of a coarse calico issue shirt, showing with hospital informality, from under his jacket, which was not buttoned up to the neck. Ah, yes, yes, he flicked through the book, dipping from time to time into the table of contents. Yes, good, I can find it all here. Thank you. Otherwise, Christ knows they might overtreat me. After all, they're only really interested in having something to fill out for their reports. Maybe I'll run away. Even a good doctor shortens your life. There, you see, Zoya threw up her hands. Why did I have to let you see it? Give it back. And she tugged at the book, first with one hand and then with both. But he hung on to it easily. You'll tear it. It's a library copy. Give it back. Her firm, round shoulders and small, firm, round arms looked as if they had been poured into the clothes-fitting uniform. Her neck was neither too thin nor too fat, too short nor too long, but just right for her figure. As they tugged at the book, they were drawn together and looked straight into each other's eyes. His uncouth face suddenly blossomed into a smile. The scar on it no longer seemed so terrible. It was paler, like an ancient wound. With his free hand, Kostoglatov softly prized her fingers from the book and spoke to her in a whisper. Zoyanka, you don't believe in ignorance. You believe in education. How can you stop people from becoming wiser? I was joking. I won't run away. 
She answered him in an aggressive whisper. You don't deserve to be allowed to read it. You neglected yourself. Why didn't you come earlier? Why come here when you're partially a corpse? Well, sighed Kostolwatov, this time half aloud. There wasn't any transport. No transport? What sort of place was it? There are always airplanes, aren't there? Why did you have to put it off to the last minute? Why didn't you move earlier to a more civilized place? Wasn't there a doctor or a feldsher or something? She let go of the book. Oh yes, there was a gynecologist. Two, in fact. Two gynecologists? Zoya gasped in amazement. Are there only women there, then? On the contrary, there aren't enough. There are two gynecologists, but no other doctors of any kind. There aren't any laboratories, either. It's impossible to get a blood test done. I had a blood count. It turned out to be 60, and no one knew a thing about it. God, what a nightmare! And then you take it upon yourself to decide whether you should be treated or not. If you haven't any pity for yourself, at least have some for your family and your children. Children. It was as if Kostoglatov had suddenly come to. And as if the whole gay tug-of-war with the book had been a dream, and he was now returning to his normal self, with his hard face and his slow way of speaking. I haven't any children. And your wife? Isn't she a human being? His speech was even slower now. No wife either. Men always say they've got no wife. Then what about those family affairs that you had to put in order? What was it you told the Korean? I told him a lie. How do I know you're not lying to me now? I'm not. I swear it. Kostoglatov's face was growing grave. It's just that I'm a choosy sort of person. I suppose she couldn't stand your personality. Zoya nodded, sympathetically. Kostoglatov shook his head very slowly. There never was a wife. Ever. Zoya tried unsuccessfully to work out his age. She moved her lips once, but decided not to put the question. She moved them again, and again did not ask. Zoya was sitting with her back to Sibgatov, and Kostoglatov was facing him. He saw him haul himself gingerly out of the little bath, clasp both hands to the small of his back, and stand there to dry. Another asterisk at the bottom of the page. Uh, an assistant doctor not fully qualified who provides medical treatment in Russian rural areas. So that's what a feldsher is. His face was that of a man who had suffered all he could, acute misery, lay behind him now, and there was nothing to lure him on toward happiness. Kostoglatov breathed in and then out, as if respiration was his whole job in life. I'm dying for a smoke. Couldn't I possibly? Certainly not. For you, smoking means death. Not in any circumstances? In no circumstances, especially not in front of me. All the same, she smiled. Perhaps I could have just one. The patients are asleep. How can you? However, he pulled out a long, empty cigarette holder, handmade and encrusted with stones, and began to suck it. And began to suck it. You know what they say. A young man's too young to get married, and an old man's too old. He leaned both elbows on her table, and ran his fingers with the cigarette holder through his hair. I nearly got married after the war, though. I was a student, and so was she. I wouldn't have minded getting married, but everything went wrong. Zoya scrutinized Kostoglatov's face. It didn't look very friendly, but it was strong. Those raw-boned arms and shoulders. But that was the disease. Didn't it work itself out? She, how does one say it, she perished. He closed one eye in a crooked grimace and started hard with the other. 
She perished, although in fact she's still alive. Last year, we wrote to each other a couple of times. He opened his other eye. He saw the cigarette holder between his fingers and put it back into his pocket. And you know... And you know, there were some sentences in those letters that set me thinking. Was she really as perfect as she seemed to me then? Perhaps she wasn't. What can we possibly understand when we're 25? His dark brown eyes looked steadily at Zoya. You, for instance, what do you understand about men? Not a damn thing. What do you understand now about men? Not a damn thing. Z Zoya burst out laughing. Maybe I understand them very well. That would be quite impossible, Kostoglatov decreed. What you call understanding isn't understanding at all. You'll get married and you'll make a big mistake. Wet blanket. Zoya shook her head from side to side. Then she put her hand in the big orange bag and brought out a piece of embroidery, which she unfolded. It was just a small piece, drawn across a frame. A green crane was already stitched in it. A fox and tankard were outlined. Kostoglatov looked at it as if it was something miraculous. You do embroidery? What's so surprising? I never imagined a modern medical student would do that sort of handwork. You've never watched girls doing embroidery? Only when I was a child, perhaps during the twenties. Even then, people thought it was bourgeois. You'd have got such a drubbing at the young communists' meeting. It's very popular these days. Haven't you seen it? He shook his head. You disapprove? No. Why would I? No. Why should I? It's nice. Gives you a comfortable feeling. I admire it. She stitched away while he looked on admiringly. She watched her work. He watched her. In the yellow light of the lamp, her golden eyelashes glimmered, and the little open corner of her dress shone golden too. Teddy bear, with the golden hair, he whispered. What's that? Still bent over her work, she raised her eyebrows. He repeated it. Oh, yes. Zoya seemed to have expected more of a compliment than that. If nobody embroiders where you come from, I suppose they have masses of Malunet in the stores. Molinet. Maulinet. What's that? Maulinet. These threads here, green, blue, red, yellow, they're very hard to come by here. Maulunet. I'll remember to ask. If there's any, I'll send you some without fail. Or if it turns out we have limited supplies, perhaps it would be simpler for you to move out there. Where's that? Where do you live? I suppose you could say in the Virgin Lands. So you're a Virgin Lander. I mean, when I went there, nobody thought they were the Virgin Lands. But now it seems they are, and Virgin Landers come out to us. When you graduate... Why don't you apply to come out? I shouldn't think they'll refuse. They wouldn't refuse anyone who applied to join us. Is it that bad? Not at all. Only, only people have distorted ideas about what's good and what's bad. To live in a five-story cage with people banging about and walking to and fro above your head and the radio blaring on all sides is considered good. But to live as a hard-working tiller of the soil in a mud hut on the edge of the steppe that's considered the height of misfortune. He wasn't joking at all. His words had the weary conviction of people who have no desire to strengthen their argument, even by raising their voice. But is it steppe or desert? This word could be steppe, stip. But is it steppe or desert? Step. No sand dunes. But there's a bit of grass. Zantak grows there. Camel thorn. You know. 
It's thorn, but it's July. But in July, it produces pinkish flowers and even a very delicate smell. The Kazakhs made a hundred medicines out of it. It's in Kazakhstan, then. Uh-huh. What's it called? Ush Terek. Is it an AUL? Yes, if you like an AUL, or a regional administrative center. There's a hospital. Only, there aren't enough doctors. Do come. He narrowed his eyes. Doesn't anything else grow there? Oh yes, there's agriculture, but under irrigation. Beets, maize. In the kitchen gardens, there's everything you could wish for. Only, you have to work hard with the bucket. In the bazaar, the Greeks always have fresh milk. The Kurds have mutton and the Germans pork. They're such picturesque bazaars. Bazaars, you should see them. Everyone wears national dress. They come in on camels. Are you an agronomist? No, land surveyor. Why do you live there, basically? Kostoglatov scratched his nose. I just adore the climate. And there's no transport. Of course there is. Motor cars. All you could want. But why should I go there? She looked sideways at him. All the time they had been talking, Kostoglatov's face had grown kinder and softer. Why should you? He furrowed the skin of his forehead as though searching for words with which to propose a toast. Zoyenka, how can you tell me which part of the world you'd be happy in, and which you'd be unhappy in? Who can say he knows that about himself? Yeah, that's the way the chapter ends. Uh, there's so many quotes in this chapter, it's pretty insane. It's very tough to, uh, to keep up and not fuck up. But there are two asterisks at the bottom of the previous page. Um, so a village in the Turkic-speaking part of Russia, uh, that's called a an Aul, A-U-L. So that's, that's a village in the Turkic-speaking part of Russia. And then the second asterisk is uh, pertaining to the, the Germans and pork. Uh, so apparently Greeks, Kurds, and Germans were among those deported to the Kazakh steppe during the immediately during and immediately after the war. I don't have to look up what that is pronounced, but yeah. So that's chapter three. Thank you for joining me tonight. And I'll start chapter four tomorrow um, at 9 p.m. Central Standard Time.